you mentioned there sex gaps. Mm -hmm. Unpack what you mean by that. Yeah. So actually, me and a team of really incredible young females in this field have been doing this thing called Invisible Sportswoman. We're on version three of it right now. Where during the pandemic, it was kind of a pandemic project with me and my friend Emma, who's the lead author on that and led everything. Where we started to look at the the gaps of you know exercise science and sports science studies done on on females versus males um, within the last five years. It was a follow up from a paper that had done it up to like 2014. And we found that I, I might be messing our numbers up, but about 6% of studies in exercise and sports science in the top five major journals were done on female only topics. And then about, I think it's 32 to 34% of total participants were done on females. And so, and the next version of that, which was just published this past year, you know, we looked at lead versus last authorship, editorial board memberships, study quality, and studies done on just females, and found, you know, that there is a lot of this work that's high quality and that's being done is led by female academics. But we also know there's that leaky pipeline in science. And so right now in this third uh, edition, which we're about to just start doing interviews for, we're doing a little bit of a quant qual analysis, is seeing like, okay, if females are leaving sports science and academia and or going industry, why are they leaving? What are these choices? Because if they're the ones leaving, leading this work, mm. right? Like, where are we losing this along the way? Uh, so, what's this going to look like in 10, 20 years? Time? Yeah, because we do, you know, I think there's a big push in awareness. And this goes beyond sports science, right? Like, I know, especially with menopause, people are very upset about the lack of research and data on that. The NIH does have a pretty big initiative um, with that and getting more funding out um, with that. But at least in sports science, everyone, you know, gets upset that there's, everything's compared to the 74 kilo male or whatever the, the cliche trope, trope that people like to use. But, you know, the research is possible, but, you know, it's not well funded, but also why aren't people doing it? And then why are the people that are doing it getting kind of lost along the way, right? Why is it that most studies are of men or, or men and women, but there's very little only female studies? Is it... Is it because women are trickier to study? Is that one so reason? So that's the, that's the thought, is that it's more complicated, so to speak, to, to, to research females. And so I always, I all, as much as I'm on this very pro of like, okay, there's these de definite sex gaps, I feel like I get defensive of early exercise science research because I think, you know, even though like I'm the second author on that publication, I'm still defensive of the fact that just because there's less research doesn't mean there's none. I think people think that there's none. And then I get defensive of early exercise physiology. Because if you look at our field historically, some of the really early studies coming out of like the Howey and Cowley and Brooks, George Brooks Labs and all that stuff, I might be butchering their last names. They did a lot of their, their studies they did on males and females. But I think that in the early 2000s and the last 20 years, a lot of this stuff that, you know, we, so to speak, established our guidelines or exercise training protocols appears to be very largely done on, on males. Um, and a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, it's harder to control for the menstrual cycle. And so a lot of people will avoid doing that because it's either more steps, it extends the timeline of your study, or it requires more money to analyze and control these things. And so I think there's been a good push now of like encouraging more researchers to at least include females in their study along with their males. I don't think that, you know, the 6% of them are just on female specific topics, which I don't think we need 100% of the female only studies to be just done on the menstrual cycle because f female health and performance is more than just the menstrual cycle, so to speak. But I think that if you're gonna include males in studies, I think there's a lot more push for justification of why you aren't including females as well. In, you know, publications and journals are asking for that justification or even like, you know, people who are putting these studies together, like, okay, can you have a female group or is this question specific to, to males, so to speak? And yeah, a lot of that does come down to the fact that it's more complicated and there's more control and that adds more stress and money to research, which is already itself time consuming and costs a lot of money to do. Yeah, I often see comments on social media and it will be a claim of, you know, such and such, maybe it's like a type of exercise or sauna mm -hmm. affected the regularity of my period. Yeah. And then I jump into the research and, you know, there may be studies that have included women, but perhaps they weren't even measuring regularity of yeah. menstruation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think that it's just kind of become this forgotten physiological variable. And, you know, there's definitely a part of research and science that views it as a burden of what they have to control for rather than something that might be affecting outcomes or even like might be impacted by the like sauna or all these things that people are doing nowadays. I know there was even stuff that came out, you know, 
during the pandemic and, you know, the vaccines and potentially impacting menstrual cycles. And it was kind of a forgotten variable of those early clinical trials. And, you know, women were frustrated because they were like, well, why is my cycle heavy or delayed? And so I do think that sometimes it becomes this forgotten variable, um, especially when we think about potentially that there's a very male-centric view, at least in sport and health and exercise science. But I do think that that gap is slowly starting to close. I mean, the Olympics are going to be at 50-50. There's more push for female health awareness coming from sports bodies. And I think that will hopefully trickle into then you know, the, the push in the health sphere as well to like, let's understand how these things are impacting us. Are current exercise guidelines, are they just broad? They're, they encompass men and women or are they broken? Is there sufficient evidence as it stands right now? Because you mentioned it's not as if there is no evidence. Mm -hmm. There is some evidence. Is there sufficient evidence to suggest that general recommendations for exercise should be distinctly different? for women versus men? I, I'm of the opinion that I don't think that we need these super specific, unique, niche female exercise training guidelines. Most things that work for males work for females. I think that there might become more data and evidence that comes out that might refine some of the details that say, hey, you know, maybe women need a little bit more of this or maybe a little bit less of this, or this is really important and that focus should come from here are the things that we should maybe value a bit more or push for, or there might be some differences. So for example, there was a paper that was just published recently that showed that, you know, women get this like more benefit or the same amount of benefit from exercise with less total minutes or time than males that just came out. And I haven't teased the data apart enough to say like, okay, this is conclusive and we should change the entire guidelines on this. But I think if that, that, that might be potentially something where we're like, oh, okay, like you get more bang for your buck, at least in that premenopausal state, potentially because of this. And some of that might have to do with estrogen and its health protective effects in that state of why we're getting benefits of that and things like that. Or like there's some studies that show, okay, females might need less rest time during intervals of high intensity interval training because we're more oxidative and we recover faster. Um, or we can train potentially at a higher percent of our one rep max because we have differences in like neuromuscular efficiency. And those were where I think we'll see small training details come along, but I don't think that it's going to be ever to a point where we're getting totally different exercise guidelines, especially when we're talking about like the broad sweeping, sweeping general population who's hardly getting in enough activity as it is. These small details may become later after they get those big, you know, foundational or basics as people like to call them or those key cornerstones of health and fitness and what we want for moving the needle forward. Um, but I do think that I would love to see some of that refinement, but I don't think it's ever going to be at the point where like the the WHO or the ACSM is going to say, oh, you need to train differently. And I think that in the social media sphere, people really think that that's where we should go and where things should be. But I think it's disingenuous also to a lot of the literature that shows that females adapt very similarly to males when they undergo exercise training routines and that our strength potential relative to at least our own body weight and size is very similar. Um, there was a, a, a review meta done by Brennan Roberts a few years ago, I think Greg Knuckles as well, and they they looked at this and the women actually gained more upper body strength, but we think that might be just due to more of a lower baseline starting, less exposure mm -hmm. to sport and fitness early on. But other than that, our- New begins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But our potential is very, very similar to that, at least relative to our own, our own selves. We're maybe never going to be as big and as strong as the elite, elite males, but we have a lot of potential. And I do think there's a lot of overlap there too, right? We see this a lot of strength athletes and sports and, you know, women on that upper end of, of things as, as we, you know, we look at people just in the training spaces. And so I think our potential is very similar, but I think those small details of refinement might come out slowly as we continue to push. And this is, you know, hopefully it's in my career and my lifespan, but I don't think it's, I think everyone wants it yesterday. But research takes a really long, slow time, and I think the next 10, 20 years, we might get some of those answers. Mm -hmm.